Oh yeah. I forgot I haven't watched this yet. By um Philosophy Tube, uh the rich have their own ethics, effective altruism in the crypto crash. Oh yeah, I forgot I haven't watched this. I'm gonna watch it with you guys now. Um If you don't know who Philosophy Tube is, I mean where you been at? Where you been at? Where you been at? Several years ago, I was invited to be the ethics consultant at a banking conference. They put me on a business class flight to a luxury hotel in Madrid. They didn't pay me, by the way. I'm guessing that was the payment. Where over several days, I and the other attendees discussed how we could fix the various problems facing the world. Healthcare, debt, financial collapse until the final day when I closed out the conference by giving my keynote speech. And my ethical advice to all these bankers was that they should immediately resign. Conferences <laughs> like that are held all the time. At the okay, top I need end, to turn you've this got stuff like the World Economic Forum, the Clinton Global Initiative, the Social Good Summit. Further down the list, there's the thing that I went to. There we go. Rich people have been trying to figure out the most effective way to get rid of their money for a long time. And there's a new movement trying to answer this question called effective altruism. It was going very well until last year when one of its big members took a big fall. The once crowned king of crypto, now Holy adorned shit, in handcuffs. That hair. Former billionaire FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried arrested in the Bahamas today following the historic financial collapse of his massive cryptocurrency exchange. Sam Bankman Fried was close friends with a Here philosopher we go. named William McCaskill who helped found the effective altruism movement. The fact that SBF was part of the movement helped him gain credibility and investors. And now that he's facing jail time, it's worth asking the question, is effective altruism to blame? In this video, I'm gonna tell you what effective altruism is and how it tied in to Sam Bankman I haven't heard anything about this, so this is all new I'll to me. I'll give you a detailed review of McCaskill's best-selling book and also talk about another idea called long-termism, which tech billionaires like Elon Musk say is the future of humankind. It's a story that'll take us from Oxford University to the Bahamas and back. A story about charity, ethics, crime, Mr. Beast, technology, and history. And it all starts with a little bit of philosophy. Here we go. <laughs> that outfit. Damn. Today, the effective altruism movement is huge, with tens of organizations and hundreds of members controlling millions of dollars. They're often in the press, in no small part, I'm not gonna be over to SBF this outfit. paying Vox $200,000 like, oh to write a bunch of articles on them. And their star philosopher, William McCaskill, wrote a best-selling book called What We Owe the Future, which was recommended by Elon Musk himself. That's how you know it's good. But the movement started from comparatively <laughs> humble beginnings in 2009 at Oxford University, when McCaskill was thinking about ethics and charity and how to help the poor. And yes, I am gonna continue pronouncing that word poor because I am from Newcastle and I'm gonna continue pronouncing that word Newcastle because that's how it's friggin' pronounced. Let me walk you through an example of the way effective altruism Don't believe thinks. Elon knows how to Twitch read. streamer and friend of the show, Finster, probably why shit at recently Twitter. announced he can't a $50,000 giveaway to help trans people in the UK get better healthcare. That money could have gone to anything, but that particular cause was Finster's choice. The trans community has been incredibly welcoming and accepting to me and me doing what I do. And I have good news. Turns out I'm not giving away $25,000. I'm giving away $50,000. Most charitable donations work like that. People choose a cause that's close to their heart. But effective altruism says we should be a little bit more rational. Let's say you've got a choice between two charities. You can either donate to one that trains guide dogs for the blind in your neighborhood, or one that gives people in developing nations medicine when they have trachoma, an infection that causes blindness. Training a guide dog takes about $40,000, and curing someone's trachoma costs about $50. So for the cost of one guide dog here, you could save about 800 people from blindness there. You might love dogs, but you could do more good, your altruism could be more effective, 
if you use your head instead of your heart. Sorry, Fenster. I should have just given the money to dogs. <laughs> we don't need to get bogged down in that specific example. It is just an example of the kind of thing effective altruists do. They try to find out which charitable causes are best. For example, you might have seen some YouTube videos sponsored by GiveWell. They're an EA organization that claims to investigate and recommend effective charities. If you're very clever, you'll already have noticed that effective altruism makes a number of key assumptions. The first is that just because somebody is far away doesn't mean they matter less. There are people who need help in your neighborhood and people who need help in developing nations. And just because some of them are closer doesn't mean you should help them first. Numbers, however, do matter. You should always help more people if you can. And the consequences of your donation matter, as opposed to your intentions or your relationship to the people that you're helping. As we'll see later on, all of these assumptions can be questioned. But first, what is this movement? Who are these people? According to their own surveys, EAs tend to be young in their 20s and 30s, male, white, and university educated. They're people who want to make the world better, obviously. Often people who are dissatisfied with politics. Most describe themselves as left-wing or center-left and atheist or agnostic. It might also be fair to say that the movement attracts a certain kind of personality, somebody who enjoys intellectual challenge and rigorous debate. Maybe people who have a little bit of a contrarian streak. Many people like that are to be found in elite institutions like Oxford I'm University still not and over this San outfit, Francisco by the way. tech startup scene. EA is two big strongholds. And indeed, many <laughs> people like that are also to Sorry, be found I just had to in say the that. audience of this show. Critics of effective <laughs> altruism say it's not really a philosophical method. It's more like an internet subculture. And there might be a grain of truth to that. A lot of EA members say that it gives them a connection to something bigger or a sense of community, and that is more about the feels than the thinkings. On the other hand, that might not be a bad thing. If your college-age white son tells you that he's gotten involved with an internet subculture, there are definitely stranger things he could be doing. A lot of EAs <laughs> also have quite high-paying jobs. The movement encourages something called earn to give. The idea is that if you take a job in finance or management consultancy with a fat paycheck, you can donate more and thereby do more good than somebody with a lower paying job. I mean, you shouldn't make landmines for children, but the idea is to find a morally neutral or good job that pays a lot and donate on the side. Advice that didn't go well in the case of Sam Bankman, Millions in investments. Bam. Sam Bankman and Fried will almost certainly face charges in the U.S. because the Bahamas will. No offenses are, are things I would get anything to be able to do over Holy again. Less than a year shit. ago, Sam Bankman Fried was one of the richest men on earth with a net worth of more than $26 billion. He founded a crypto trading company called FTX, which quickly became one of the largest crypto hubs in the world. But at the end of 2022, it all came crashing down. In a matter of days, FTX tanked, and Sam was arrested on multiple counts of fraud and money laundering. Allegedly, he was using his clients' funds to gamble on the stock market, like the bad guy from Casino Royale. And when authorities finally <laughs> caught up with him, they found him whipping Daniel Craig's balls with a length of rope. The collapse of FTX God, may deal. have sent crypto into an irreversible decline, only time will tell. And it also sent ripples through the effective altruism movement. To understand why, we need to go back to the beginning. When SPF was still a student, he was considering a career in animal welfare when he happened to meet William McCaskill, who told him he could earn to give by going into finance. So Sam started a trading company called Alameda Research, and then he started yeah, FTX. Yeah, I get that, Phoenix. He let it's, his ex-girlfriend run wild. Alameda whilst he ran FTX from the Bahamas. Be because it's just so nice there. You know, I'm, I'm sure the fact that it's outside American financial authority jurisdiction had nothing to do with it. <laughs> just to make sure, I sent Philosophy Tube's lawyer, Trixie Mephistopheles, down to the Bahamas to form an expert opinion. Trixie? How's your investigation going? It's doing great! FTX's job was to let customers convert crypto into real money and back, whilst Alameda's job was just to trade the stock market. They were supposed to be separate operations, but long story short, it now looks like those two companies were secretly working as one. 
Alameda was losing huge amounts of cash, and FTX was secretly transferring billions out of the back door to keep them afloat. Meanwhile, Alameda was buying cryptocurrency to keep the price of FTX's assets artificially high. Kind of like double dipping on the salsa, but also I stole your chips. When the news broke, people started selling their crypto and FTX didn't have enough money in the back to give them their cash because they'd sent it all to Alameda. They filed for bankruptcy and now they owe money to more than a million people, including a $55,000 tab at a Bahamas resort called Margaritaville. Sam bankman fried and his associates were arrested and charged with fraud, which he says he didn't mean to do. His associates <laughs> pled guilty almost immediately, I didn't mean and to Sam do himself it. will stand trial later this year. Fun fact, his lawyer is the same guy who represented Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, and it was McCaskill uh, who uh, started him down that path. Ironically, by trying to do good, McCaskill ended up contributing to a very great harm. That's the law of unintended consequences, and it's almost as strict as the law of securities fraud. The big investors will probably be fine, but the little guys who tried to get into crypto and lost everything, they're the ones who are suffering. It might be tempting to laugh, but we should remember that anyone can fall victim to a scam. SBF used effective altruism to present himself as someone who cared about ethics over profit. He pledged a lot of money to EA-approved charities, and he may even have been sincere. But a lot of people in the movement were pretty disappointed. It looks like the money he promised to charity isn't coming. At least not before yeah, somebody I mean, if pays you back just subbed to me, all those pina coladas. Although I find it funny that McCaskill when publicly denounced Lord Kasma donated and some critics like are gifted those uh, of subs, you didn't get what? The community is a relentless <laughs> grift. It has billions in the bank, That's a palatial ironic. estate in Oxfordshire, and links to some of the richest people on the planet. Hundreds of millions of dollars are poured back into the community for movement building and leading EAs while presenting themselves as modest and self-sacrificing. No, you're fine, Phoenix. Rant away. But hundreds this is a safe of millions place to in Bahamian rent. real estate and were offered literally millions from tech billionaires to boost book sales. If you want to do good in the world, and you should, steer clear of EA. Yeah, no, it's harsh ironic, words. isn't it, Phoenix? <laughs> and maybe a little bit too harsh? There were people within the movement who said from the start that getting involved with crypto yeah, and SBF Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, it's kind of funny because you were like, you were here in the chat and like people that aren't even in the chat or weren't in the chat. I don't think it's fair <laughs> to say that the entire <laughs> Got thing one, is a but you didn't, and there you were already were here. people who spoke up and tried to do it's the like, right it sucks. <laughs> the problem seems to be that the movement's leaders didn't listen to them. Going back a few years, it seems like this is a recurring problem. A recent article in Time magazine details allegations by several women that they were harassed or abused by prominent men within the movement, and that when they spoke out, they weren't listened to. In 2021, the philosopher Zoe Kramer wrote a paper criticizing certain aspects of EA methodology. She was a member and thought they'd appreciate some constructive feedback, but the reception she got was pretty chilly. The EA community prides itself on being able to invite and process criticism. However, warm welcome of criticism was certainly not our experience in writing this paper. Senior scholars within the field told us in private that they were concerned that any critique of central figures in EA would result in an inability to secure funding from EA sources such as open philanthropy. We don't know if these concerns are warranted. Nonetheless, any field that operates under such a chilling effect is neither free nor fair. Having yeah, a handful that's of wealthy donors and their advisors dictate the evolution of an entire field is bad epistemics at best and corruption at worst. Writing a critical piece should not incur negative consequences on one's career options, personal life, and social connections in a community that is supposedly great at inviting yeah, and accepting you know, criticism. Because you know what like that means? Disaster isn't the only you know what that time means? That if there's consequences like that, the then you live under a dictatorship, Kramer, not a free state. <laughs> and he wants to start actively funding critics in order to strengthen the movement's ideas. To which I can only say, well, patreon.com slash philosophy tube. <laughs> the new shtick is we know how to ethically spend other people's money and some of your biggest guys turn out to be fraudsters and creeps. It kind of doesn't look good. 
But effective altruists could come back and say that these are organizational problems that a lot of movements have. But the ideas are still good. Maybe there's work to be done in terms of how they're implemented. And also making sure that everyone in the movement is safe, but the goal is still worth striving for. And if this were a different video essay channel, that's probably where I'd leave it. I've told you what effective altruism is and why it's in the news. So now is the part where I say Instagram, TikTok, Patreon, Nebula, bish bash bosh. But <laughs> this is Philosophy Tube. And on this show, we like to go a little bit deeper. Everything I've told you so far is not the full story. There are bigger questions for effective altruism, not just as a movement, but as a philosophy. One big question in particular, which I'd like to tease out now by taking a detailed look at McCaskill's book and turning our minds towards Future. The years of the 21st it's century, literally just going to be like a BDSM. Effective altruism started to change. Leather. There was still an <laughs> emphasis on ethics and charity, but the movement's leaders, including McCaskill, embraced a new thought called long termism, which is all about threats from the future. McCaskill says we are living at a critical time. Mammal species typically survive about 2 million years, and humans first evolved about 200,000 years ago, so we're pretty near the start of our story. But recently, we have acquired the power to destroy ourselves. If we're not careful, we might not make it much further. We're like teenagers, he says. The decisions we make now will profoundly affect the rest of our lives, so we need to be careful. The trillions of human beings who are yet to be born are counting on us. So if you want to do good, the most effective thing you can do is safeguard the people of the future. Long-termism is about taking seriously just how big the future could be and how high the stakes are in shaping it. What we do now will affect untold numbers of future people. We need to act wisely. I'll start with what I liked about the book. McCaskill has some interesting discussions of the ways that technology can affect society's values. The idea is that when you create a piece of tech to do a <laughs> job, it becomes more difficult to ask, should this job be That was always your done? plan. We talked about that on the show last year in my episode on transhumanism. I do wish he'd gone into a little bit more detail because there are other philosophers who've talked about that before. Bruno Latour, Evgeny Morozov, Martin Heidegger, and he doesn't mention any of them, but it is interesting stuff. Some of McCaskill's critics have accused him of deliberately downplaying the threat from climate change, focusing too much on the future and not enough on the right now. And he is a little bit tame compared to certain other writers. He likes the idea of non-violent protest and green non-profits. Just compare that to the philosopher Andreas Malm, who we talked about on the show last year. He wrote a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. So, McCaskill's a bit reserved compared to others working in the field, but <laughs> eh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a stretch to say that he deliberately downplays it, and he even says this. In order to solve climate change, what we actually need is for companies like Shell to go out of business. Based. I also think he effectively <laughs> handles one of the big challenges to long-termism, a challenge that's often posed to effective altruism classic as well. It goes like this. Suppose a homeless person asks you for money and you've got three pounds in your pocket, but you're a dedicated, effective altruist. So you say no, because you don't know what they're going to spend that money on. You don't know the consequences of that action. Instead, you put that money towards buying malaria nets for somebody 3,000 miles away. A critic might say that you've missed the point of morality. A human being asked you for help and you ignored them. 
You could have given them that money. You could have given them something more valuable by looking them in the eye and saying, I'm sorry, it's all I've got on me right now, but I hope things turn around for you. You could have given them your respect, even if it wouldn't have the optimum consequences. Isn't morality about human beings and the way that we treat each other? I mean, what about justice? What about generosity? What about kindness? I mean, yes, you might say those arbitrary emotional attachments, but isn't having arbitrary emotional attachments what being human is all about? I mean, we might as well let the computers take over if you're just going to make all your decisions like frickin' Spock. Finally, someone agrees with me. And what this amounts to <laughs> is rejecting the idea that consequences are the main thing that matters when it comes to charity. We can make this same objection specific to long-termism too. McCaskill worries about future people, but future people, by definition, do not exist. We can worry about the consequences of our actions for children who are alive now, but the people of the 31st century are imaginary. How can we say that they have rights or they should be treated a certain way? That's not to say that we should never think about the future. <laughs> just that if we do, then Phoenix, protecting are you just, them Are you over here defending your husband in a... Because there is no In an imaginary them. argument. <laughs> Again, isn't morality about real people and the way that we treat each other? McCaskill has quite a good response to all this. He says, yes, doing ethics about the people of the future can seem a little bit bloodless and abstract, but it kind of has to be because of the impact that we all have every day on the future. If you live in a city, then by choosing to take public transport to work and back rather than drive, over the course of a year, you will ever so slightly impact the schedules of tens of thousands of people over hundreds of days. Statistically, it's likely that on one out of those tens of thousands of person days, stand for the spot slander. <laughs> sex and conceived a child later in that day, and you affected ever so slightly the timings of that conception, changing which sperm met the egg, and thus changing who was born. That different person will then impact the schedules of millions of other people, changing what children they have, and so on in an identity cascade. Past a certain date, everyone who is ever born will be different from who would have been born had you chosen to drive instead. And the entire course of future history will be different. Wars will be fought that would never have been fought, monuments built that would never have been built, works of literature written that would never have been written, all because you chose to take the bus. Philosophers call this the non-identity problem. Our actions don't just affect what kind of lives people in the future will lead, we affect who they will be. So any discussion about future people kind of has to miss out on their individuality because it's constantly in flux. This point was originally made by a philosopher called Derek Parfit, and McCaskill's discussion of it is quite interesting. Although, just because you're summarizing what another philosopher said in an entertaining way, that doesn't make you clever. Wait, what? Turning now to what I didn't <laughs> like so much about the book, you can kind of tell it was written by a man because there is almost zero discussion of reproductive rights. If I was bringing out a book in current year about the moral duties that we have to unborn people, the first thing I would have put in it, page one, 72 point font, do not use this book to criminalize abortion. Maybe he'll discuss that in a future edition. McCaskill talks about the threat to humanity from AI, and I personally found his discussion of it to be a little bit thin. He says that software can be easily copied between computers. Just look at the video game Pong. It came out on the Atari, but now you can play it in your browser or you can even play it on your phone. It's everywhere. So, like, what if a rogue AI? God, I mean, these also days you could probably play it on a fucking around the net in a similar fashion. That could refrigerator be a really with one of those and screens I feel on like it. He's generalizing there from quite a specific case. Pong is a very simple program. That's why you can run it on other things. Like, I don't think you could run Skynet on an Atari. Surely a rogue AI I mean, AI someone out there would probably try. <laughs> so it would require things like server racks and... Oh, I know. People love to put Doom on everything. Physical infrastructure that everything. would make it vulnerable and probably help keep it in check. Also, Pong is an outlier even as far as games go. A lot of old video games aren't archived. To generalize from Pong what if an AI to world-ending AI the in the space of two paragraphs is, in my this opinion, is a, future we don't want a little people. bit rushed. <laughs> if you're trying to argue that one of the best uses of charity money in the world is researching AI based on that example, if I was an investor, I'd be going, 
is there someone else I can talk to? And there <laughs> is. This is The Precipice by Toby Ord, the other philosopher at Oxford who also helped found the effective altruism movement and who is also a long-termist. This book came out first and it's basically McCaskill's, but a little bit better. I don't think that McCaskill is ripping Ord off, but McCaskill said humanity is like a teenager. Ord said it first. McCaskill says that technology can lock in bad values long-term. Ord said it first. Ord has a whole discussion about asteroids, which McCaskill reproduces almost exactly. But I found Ord to be more persuasive. He's more detailed. I gotta play. He I have points of view. He doesn't put all of his eggs in the consequences <gasps> oh, basket, so he doesn't necessarily actually, have to muck around with a non-identity problem. His discussion of AI is stronger too. He says, yes, "I have that. A rogue I have AI it downloaded and everything. Like that's on my. Acts, that's on my future it can manipulate people into plays it. list." Now Russia that I'm streaming again, I've already got down. Could right now create a deep fake of the I'm president be saying something that outrageous and spread it on social media the to try and influence and manipulate people. And if a person can manipulate people, then a rogue AI could too. Welcome to the 20th yeah, I love me some point and click. I love me some point and click. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and for the Republicans, a chatbot made of everything Tucker Carlson's ever said. <laughs> if you're looking for a book about long termism, I would say get this one. My official review of McCaskill is that it's oh, it has multiple endings. The intellectual yeah, I've tried. I haven't seen like anything of it, so though. I've I've tried to like keep it spoiler free, so I don't know anything about it except bare bones basics. Okay, well, maybe I'm not one to talk. And you oh yeah, Ga oh Gabriel God. Knight. You've never the first one. I've got it downloaded, book. and that's true. It's on the list, near future. In the present, I'm getting back into my point and but click in the days. Future. I could I'm write just a getting. Great book. I could write the I'm getting best disappointed book in these ever, like and be awarded many honorary recent games that are just depressing me. So I'm just going to play point and click games most of the time. Based on the expected value of my book, which will top the New York Times bestseller list in the year 3054, and you might not find that joke funny now. But there is a small chance that you will find it extremely funny in the future. So really, <laughs> you should be laughing. I'm being a little bit silly, but it's in service of a serious point. A big question hanging over it's both based of these on a books, book too. and it's maybe best friends. the entire a long time ago. altruism movement. Oh God, the best it friends, let's play like Jesus. This. Imagine you're walking home one night, and somebody stops you and says, I am the wallet inspector. Give me your wallet and I will return it to you tomorrow with 100 pounds inside as a reward for your cooperation. And you say, no. And so they say, okay, how about a thousand pounds? A million, a billion pounds. I am a wizard in addition to being the wallet inspector. I will give you a billion pounds and make you live a million years. And you say, no, there is almost zero chance that you're telling the truth. The odds of you telling the truth are one in a trillion. But the wallet inspector keeps promising you more and more to the point that even though the odds of them telling the truth are tiny, you've got a one in a trillion chance at paradise. And all you're gonna lose is whatever you've got in your wallet. So the rational thing to do is hand it over. But you're stubborn, you still say no. So the wallet inspector changes tactic and says, unless you give me your wallet, humanity will end. I can see the future using my wizard powers. If you don't hand over your wallet, you'll drop it on your way home. And tomorrow morning, yeah, I know they have like separate channels too, where will they like play games and, and stuff. And he will be slightly delayed in his journey, which means he will like, have sex. Not only the podcast, but they also like play games. Done, conceiving a different child than he would have done, and that child is super Hitler. So unless you give me your wallet, the future is It's hard for you to watch Matt doomed. stuff though, because you, think you got the Liam in the voice, and you don't really like Liam. Oh my God, Phoenix! tiny, but. The risk to the future is huge. The voices are Trillions messy. Millions of lives are depending on this. So you need to do the right thing and safeguard the people of the future by handing over your wallet. This thought <laughs> experiment is called Pascal's mugging. And it's supposed to highlight the difficulty of making decisions now based on future value or future risk. Clearly, something's gone wrong in these scenarios. And in a footnote to McCaskill's book, he says that we should just put such cases to the side. But I'm not satisfied. I think we're on the trail of something big. If you're very clever, you'll already have been asking back in part one, how do effective altruists decide which charities are the most effective? And I have a clever answer to that. You do an experiment and you find out. 
For example, you find a bunch of blind people and you give some of them medicine and some of them advice about cleaning their eyes and you see which works best. Oh they weren't the first people to think of this. Economists have been playing around with it since the 90s. But the idea is pretty simple. Run charity like a science experiment. Thing is, oh my God, there are Phoenix. some tactics for helping the poor, like medicine, <laughs> that are easy to study. Z-drama. But what it about things is. like reforming political and financial systems? That might help the poor a whole lot, maybe even more than charity. But it's tough to study that without actually doing it. Critics say this results in measurability bias. EA tends to favor short-term, small-scale interventions that don't tackle the root of the problems. Some of those short-term interventions don't last or have long-term negative effects. This is all to say that it is by no means settled what effective actually means. And in fairness to them, some EAs are aware of this and they do talk about it. But none of the EA philosophers I've read quite seem to understand the depth of this issue. The lesson from Pascal's mugging and the measurability bias problem is that evidence and reasoning will only get you part of the way. What gets you the rest of the way is clout. Given incomplete evidence, who can fill in the gaps clout. to tell the most persuasive story? Persuade you to give them your money. And if clout is what's filling in those gaps, <sighs> that prompts the big question. Who has all the clout? That is Remember back at the, the start, question. I said that rich people have been trying to give their money away for a long time. Well, in his book, Winners Take All, the journalist Anand Giri Hadara says that modern philanthropy was invented in the late 19th centuries when the USA was very unequal. Men like Andrew Carnegie and J.D. Rockefeller got very rich and faced a lot of criticism for it. So they invented a new way to donate money, the private foundation. And these days, private foundations are everywhere. In exchange for their charity, these men expected not to get criticized for how they made their money. If they engaged in unsafe working practices or union busting or they didn't pay their taxes, well, that's just a temporary blip on the road to a better world. And here we can see that the effective altruist idea of earn to give is really nothing new. It's just a restatement of this old idea that the best way to help people is through the free market and business. Through giving money away, yes, but never changing the system that makes the money. And from the 19th century to the present day, this idea has remained pretty much unaltered. Here's a recent quote from a British politician which perfectly encapsulates this 19th century way of thinking about the poor. I think the dynamics of capitalism and business creation and investment are good. If you want a more equal society, what's the best way to do it? Is it to lift up those at the bottom or to bring down those at the top? I'd much rather lift up those at the bottom. I'm very aspirational. Giri Hadaris points out that if you want to get invited back to the banking conference, if you want to do TED Talks and corporate speaking gigs, if you want book deals and a high paying job, if you want newspapers to support your political party, you kind of have to toe that line. Don't talk about Lenin at the banking conference. <laughs> if you want clout, that world is where the clout is. If only I had told that conference what they wanted to hear. Somewhere in a parallel universe, there's an alternate version of me and she doesn't have any integrity, but she does own a house. I think that effective <laughs> altruism is very well suited to oh, that Oh, the sad truth the of that. The sad particular. truth of that. There's almost no politics in here. It's very win-win, very it's business how you, It's how friendly. you get a house these days. Because it's a fusion you sell of your soul. 19th century ideas about poverty you with it out? modern development economics Either and way. some ethical philosophy. I'm sure McCaskill would come back and say that effective altruism is about following the evidence. If it turned out that the best way to help the poor was through socialist revolution, well, then he'd be all for it. But remember, measurability bias. The evidence only takes you part of the way. And when there are gaps, it's that world of business clout that rushes in to fill them. This might explain why EA was such an easy mark for crypto. The crypto sphere is part of <sighs> hype about how we're all going to make it. 
You get a house by making your rich parents buy you one. Yeah. It might also help explain why a lot of the charities they recommend are run by Westerners instead of by the people on the ground. EA has indoctrinated its followers to strictly support a small, select list of charities that have been labeled most effective I love how by the movement's own charity raiders, like Give Well, There's another EA can, that's being shitty. Save, etc. It's not just the, the game developers. Right now, the game publishes western if you randomly asked one of the people who themselves also this one live with in abject poverty there is no chance that they will mention one of ea's supported effective charities as having impacted their lives more than the work of traditional it comes with the name anti poverty if you agencies. have and it seems like EA's ea leaders, don't as really like want your to talk about that shorthand name and Ord write a lot about doomed. progress and humanity's doomed, potential i tell you but they say almost nothing about who gets to define those concepts who gets seen as an expert who decides what counts as evidence whose vision of the future gets listened to in my opinion, those aren't side questions to hide in the footnotes. They're core to the whole project. And if the movement had listened to them a few years ago, maybe the FTX disaster could have been avoided. But on the other hand, just because the movement dovetails nicely with the ideology of the rich doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. Effective altruists could come back and say, well, philanthropy does a lot of good Effective altruism is probably better than nothing, right? I mean, at least we're doing something. This perspective is especially pertinent right now because one of the biggest YouTubers in the world is a philanthropist. Mr. Beast is basically the most famous man on earth if you're under 25. And he recently came under fire for this video in which he paid for oh, a thousand yeah. blind people to have surgery restoring their sight. I kept seeing that Some pop up. I was like, who was the fuck is Mr. Beast? To turn charity into <laughs> I was like... Spectacle. Others said that people in need shouldn't have to rely on the random generosity of content creators. And before anyone in my comments goes in too hard on Mr. Beast, a lot of those criticisms could be applied to me. I've used this platform to do public charity before. Did I do that because I really wanted to do the right thing or was I just trying to make you like me, which benefits my career? An effective altruist might say, well, does it really matter? There are a thousand people who were blind yesterday and they can see today. Isn't that a fact worth celebrating? The real question we're bumping up against here is, how do we change the world? Do we work within the system or try to dismantle it? Do we talk to bankers or try and shut them down? If a movement is trying to do good, how do we deal with the bad things that it also does? These aren't questions that I can answer for you. They're questions that we all live inside of. I would never tell you to either join or not join the effective altruist movement. My job is to tell you what the theory says and why people believe it, so that whatever you decide to do, you do it with your eyes open. I'm very intrigued by this topic of who gets to tell stories. And I got to tell my own recently. I wrote a play called The Prince, which was on oh, in London. It's about a bunch of characters in a Shakespeare play who start to realize that they're all stuck inside a play. And we were struggling to finance the show until I went to a streaming service called Nebula and said, hey, what if you guys paid for it and then filmed it and hosted the film on your streaming service? They took a chance on me as a new writer, but it paid off because the show immediately sold out, made a profit, and won a whole bunch of awards. Like, absolute dream scenario. Damn. So if you would like to see that show, you can at go.nebula.tv slash theprince. That's where it'll be, along with every episode of Philosophy Tube, which gets uploaded to Nebula early and without ads. And not just Philosophy Tube either. There's loads of creators on Nebula. Remember Lindsay Ellis? Used to make really good video essays, then retired from YouTube? Well, she's back making new content exclusively on Nebula. And there's more. Nebula subscribers get free goodies. Like we had a red carpet premiere in New York City for the Prince and Damn Nebula queen. subs got free tickets. So Nebula's good. It's $2.50 a month if you get the annual plan, which is absurdly cheap compared to other streaming services. It helps me out, it helps the crew out, and it's a very effective way, haha, of spending your entertainment budget. <laughs>
would never take those. I don't know the drama. <laughs> like I stay, I try to stay away from drama so much. I honestly am clueless. <laughs> like Phoenix, you and you and Yomi are like my uh, my informers of shit I don't know about on the internet. <laughs> I enjoyed that video though. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right, is it just the? Is this just like 500 hours of just? Oh, oh, there's a little part at the end. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say to after the credits, all this this money, the money is real, but it's not mine. And don't worry, it doesn't belong to my patients. It actually belongs to Finster, who just like had that. I just had it. Thank you very much. <laughs> just like had it on him because he, I don't know, is in London. Uh. <laughs> Leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for loaning us that. Okay. Okay then. <laughs> Oh, I enjoyed that video. That was a good one. That was a good one. Oh, man.